Well, I grew up among photographic equipment because my father was an amateur photographer. So my first memories were really of photography. And maybe one difference with other kids, I spent a lot of time in the dark room with my father watching him develop. So at that age, I mean, the night didn't, darkness didn't have much fear for me. I didn't have much fear for darkness. And, and then uh, I started to take pictures when I was 12. My father, his friend in Nice, we had moved from Algeria, where I was born, to Paris, where I met Man Ray, he was a friend of my father, in Nice. And there I helped him, and this uh, gentleman was the official photographer for the city of Nice. So I went around with him, and this is where you learn the tricks of a trade. The difference between an amateur and a professional is a professional always comes back with something. It may not be perfect, but he'll always brings back a bacon. And it's tricks, it's all tricks to the trade. And that's how, at the age of 19, I went to England, which was officially my country. And at 21, I got on a staff of life. I had pictures in the first issue. Being a life photographer in the States is different, was different from abroad, because everybody loved life. Everybody wanted to be in life, and when a life photographer came, they were enchanted. I mean, plus, another thing is Americans are very good on camera. I mean, they find it natural to be in shirt sleeves. I mean, President Roosevelt would be photographed in shirt sleeves without thinking twice, whereas you couldn't get even a middle-class Englishman to take his jacket off. You know, they were much more formal. So Americans lent themselves to picture stories, so it made it much more pleasant and easy. Most of my work was in hostile countries, so you had to improvise. Then, of course, the other difference in my colleagues, if it was an American story, I mean, the office would know exactly what it was, send out a researcher, and they would plan it, and photographer do this, do that. Now, in my case, for instance, they would say, do Poland. Or, as they said, go to Vienna, something is happening. Well, there's something happening was Hitler took over a country of eight million, and 24 hours out, the shot being fired. Well, there you couldn't plan it. You had to do, you had to plan, do it yourself. So what happened is I developed a technique which others like Duncan, etc., my dance, we would plan a story, shoot it, research it, shoot it, write the captions, and if need be, write a story. And that's what, what is really, that is photojournalism. Phillips counted on Vienna's confusion during the first few days of occupation to let him get his shots and get out. Some of these pictures were hidden in the overcoat of an unsuspecting Nazi party member who sat next to Phillips on a train. Phillips and his cameras were searched, the official and his belongings were not, and in the middle of the night, the films were retrieved and sent off for publication. My assignments are probably, and I say during the war, see two things would be overseas, so quite obviously, you couldn't see where you were going or you knew things. I mean, for instance, I remember an example. I was in, I went up to uh, uh, Lebanon and I said, uh, what's cooking to our military attache? He said, well, uh, it was August, he said. We have a, we're going to have a, some spies that tried on uh, September 29th, 28th, and they will be shot the 29th. I said, well, gee whiz. No, I, the uh, try is the 28th, and I said, yeah, I thought you would shot them the next day. He said, yeah, we'll shoot them the 29th. Now, I couldn't cable to life. We are going to have a spy trial, give them a fair trial, and shoot them the next day, next month, you know. So what you would have to do is you would go. You knew it was a story that life would like, and you shot it. So you really knew what the editors wanted, and you went after that type of picture. So uh, it was uh, your assignments in wartime were very broad. I mean... Uh, if you assigned, you assigned the Italian front, so you got everything that could be possibly interesting. I was behind the lines, but you can give somebody a detailed assignment. I mean, when you go into Germany and blow a bridge up, you know, so you had to play it by ear. I started with 35 millimeter. You see, 35 millimeter, when I started in, what was it, 1930, a friend of my father got his, Monsieur Pensier got his camera. And we suddenly discovered it was a whole new world because in those days, even though the film was slow, we still had a fastest film thanks to the movies. We also had an F2 lens and with uh, 50 millimeters, so it gave you a pretty good depth of focus. And if you learn how to handle it, you could shoot an eighth of a second and in certain cases a half second. Now you could get results you could have never got before. So we always, our whole trick was to go in minimum lights, the circus, on a the theater, 
night scenes, cafe scenes, things which were absolutely new. Now, believe it or not, the regular, the old timers hated us because they were very worried. They had these big cameras, you know, they had three things, portrait and <coughs> middle, medium shot, <coughs> distance shot, that was all. And it was just slapdash, you developed it, you overdeveloped, you underdeveloped it. Okay, we had to be very precise. And so a 35 millimeter, if you knew how to use it, could do fantastic things. So when I started in life, I started with, I used 35 millimeters all of my life, except at certain times, I added to my equipment a, a two and a quarter, two and a quarter, first of all, a, and uh, then a Hasselblad. Now I've gone back to 35 millimeter, and I even would even want to have flashlight equipment, because I think you, for what I want to do, I do it with normal lighting, available light. I prefer black and white. I've done color if I have to, but I like black and white. I think um, it's completely different. You see, color, you have to create something different. Now, obviously, since colors come into existence, you can do flowers, trees, mountains, the Matterhorn, all of that in black and white. But most of the stuff is much more dramatic. And I'll give you an example. When I photographed Tito's funeral, I had a widow and her two sons standing there in tears, and I did it both in black and white in color. And in a book I used, I used the black and white because the black and white was much more dramatic. Color, you have to adapt it. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a new language. Otherwise, it gets to be a, a cliché. It's very nice for amateurs. You put a roll of film, photograph 36 pictures, they all come out perfect. But if you want to do it professionally, you then have to do something a little different. For 50 years, John Phillips documented the people, places, and conflicts that have shaped today's world. Was it his camera that brought him to history, or was he a witness to history who brought a camera? I think both. I mean, if it hadn't been for my camera, obviously, I'd have never been here. See, I did things that the richest man in the world couldn't do. You couldn't buy it. I mean, to have a ringside seat at all these events, you were there and you were invited because, or they wanted you there as a witness, or you got in. So really, uh, nobody could have done it. I mean, the only other person who did it, if you like, is a famous book of Herman Wook, and he had to invent this Navy officer who was sent by Roosevelt to have him in all these different places where I was. But I was there simply because life wanted the pictures. So obviously, the camera got me there, and then, also, you would have to convince people it would be a good idea to let you in, you see. So one thing helped with the other. It's fundamentally the camera who gets you in.